We now have an understanding of cyclones and anticyclones. Let's use that knowledge to better understand the global pressure and wind system. If the Earth were a non-rotating sphere of uniform surface, we'd expect a very simple pattern. Cold polar regions would be high pressure. Warm equatorial regions would be low pressure. And winds would flow from high to low pressure. Of course, this is not what happens at all. The Earth is rotating and has much more uneven surface, and there's a lot more complexities to the global wind and pressure system. In Chapter 3, we introduced a simple model, though we didn't explain why it worked this way. We noted that there was patterns to the winds. Between 0 and 30 degrees, both north and south, the winds flowed from the east. From 30 to 60 degrees, both north and south, the winds flowed from the west. And from 60 to 90 degrees, both north and south, the winds flowed again from the east. This is what we used in Chapter 3 when we were talking about the influences of atmospheric circulation on temperature, etc. But we're going to get much more sophisticated and develop a much more robust model than this. The model that we're going to develop in this video clip still does have three winds and very much the same way that the previous model did, but we're also identifying four pressure zones. I encourage you to pause the video for a moment and write down these four pressure zones and these three wind systems. The intertropical convergence zone occurs near the equator. Subtropical highs are located at or near 30 degrees north and south. The subpolar low, which your book calls the polar front, is located near 60 degrees north and south, and the polar high is located near the poles at 90 degrees north and south. The three winds are always flowing from high pressure to low pressure. The trade winds flow from the subtropical high to the intertropical convergence zone at the equator. The westerlies also flow from the subtropical high, but they flow towards the polar front. And the polar easterlies flow from the high pressure at the poles to the polar front. Now that you've written the seven components down in your notes, take a look at your notes and identify all seven components on this diagram. Start with the pressure zones, the intertropical convergence zone here at the equator, subtropical highs, the polar front, and the polar high. Then notice the winds, the trade winds blowing towards the equator from the subtropical highs, the westerlies blowing from the subtropical highs towards the, pol towards the polar front, and the polar easterlies from the polar high to the polar front. Again, winds are always blowing from high to low pressure. We're going to go through each of these components now in more detail, starting with the intertropical convergence zone. The name of the intertropical convergence zone is very descriptive. It occurs near the equator. That's within the tropics, intertropical. And it's a region of converging air. Remember from our last video clip that airflow around a low pressure cell in the northern hemisphere is counterclockwise and convergent. So air is flowing towards the equator. As we have previously noted, warm equatorial air expands and rises, thus creating a low pressure zone. So the intertropical convergence zone is a low pressure zone. Within the ITCZ, the weather is warm, calm, and cloudy. The dominant air movement is upward, not horizontal. And the rising, moist air cools to form clouds. Notably, the ITCZ moves north and south a bit with the seasons. It's not always exactly over the equator. The movement is more pronounced over the continents than over the oceans because the continents tend to heat up faster and to a greater extent than the oceans. And warm rising air creates the low pressure cell that makes up the intertropical convergence zone. 
So the ITCZ is a low pressure zone near the equator with rising air. You can see the ITCZ in this, in this satellite image near the equator here where there is a preponderance of clouds. We noted that the global system does not just simply have a convection cell from the poles to the equator, but indeed the tropical regions do seem to have a simple vertical convection cell. Air rises at the equators. At high, high altitudes, the air actually starts to move poleward, and it gets colder, and it descends at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude at what we call the subtropical highs. 30 degrees north and south are high pressure zones because the air is descending upon them. The name subtropical high is quite descriptive. It's a high pressure in the subtropics, that means just outside the tropics, and weather in the subtropical high is calm and clear. The dominant air movement is down, not horizontal. Additionally, in general, air, rising air is needed for cloud formation. Since the air in the subtropical high is descending, there's no clouds and thus no rain. As we noted previously, many or most of the world's deserts are in or near the subtropical high. The subtropical high cells are huge and take up most of the major ocean basins at 30 degrees north and south. Additionally, these cells are very consistent over the ocean basins, but less consistent over land. Why is that? Well, consider what happens to land within the continent interior in the summer. It heats up and expands and rises. Rising air creates a low pressure cell. Thus, in the winter, there may be evidence of subtropical high over southern Asia here but it's absent in the summer because it breaks up because of the rising air. Also, just as the ITCZ shifts with the seasons, so does the subtropical high. It moves slightly north in northern hemisphere summer and slightly to the south in northern hemisphere winter. And we'll see that this shift is what's responsible for giving California our long, dry summers. We've now discussed a high pressure zone, the subtropical high, and a low pressure zone, the intertropical convergence zone. Next, let's check out the winds that connect them. Again, winds flow from high to low. Figure 5.18 in your text is a pretty informative figure. It shows the intertropical convergence zone with its cloudy rising air, the low pressure, and it shows the subtropical high around 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south. And then you can see that the trade winds flow from the subtropical highs to the intertropical convergence zone. You could say that the northeast and southeast trades converge at the intertropical convergence zone. Notice how these winds are named. We named winds from the direction from when they come from. So we have the northeast trades, and we have the southeast trades. The southeast trades are coming from the southeast to the intertropical convergence zone, and the northeast trades are coming from the northeast into the intertropical convergence zone. Refer back to the six pressure diagrams I asked you to draw in the previous video clip. You drew them, right? Look at your diagram of surface winds, lower atmosphere winds, in a high pressure cell in the northern hemisphere. From a high pressure cell in the northern hemisphere, the surface winds would be clockwise and divergent. Now look again at this diagram. A high pressure cell, the surface winds are clockwise and divergent. Indeed, these here, coming from the subtropical high, diverging outward in a clockwise manner, towards the intertropical convergence zone are our northeast trade winds. And we see the mirror image in the southern hemisphere, remembering that the, the direction of the winds is going to be reversed, so it's counterclockwise here, but diverging outward towards the equatorial area of the intertropical convergence zone. Those are the southeast trades.
Lastly, look at the other wind that's created from the subtropical high as the air is diverging outward in a clockwise direction. This is going to be the westerlies, the next wind that we deal with. So really, if you can draw the diagram for a high pressure cell in, in the lower atmosphere winds in a high pressure cell showing the divergent clockwise flow, that's the crux of understanding much of the global wind and pressure system. You can see the trade winds in this diagram flowing from 30 degrees north, the subtropical high, to the intertropical convergence zone near the equator. And we can see them again in this diagram here. All these diagrams showing the same thing. The intertropical convergence zone, a low, zone is a low pressure, subtropical high is a high pressure, and the winds are diverging out of that subtropical high and converging at the intertropical convergence zone. The trade winds get their name because they were used for shipping trade back when we relied on ships to move products around the world. The trade winds are very consistent, so they were reliable to use for shipping. You can see in this diagram here that the frequency of the winds, more than 90% of the time the winds in, in these darker red regions are flowing in a manner consistent with what we would predict from the trade winds. 70, 90, 70 to 90% um, is shown in orange here, and 50 to 70% is shown in green. Again, a very consistent wind, at least in January. Check out what happens in July. Most of the world remains consistent in terms of very consistent trade winds, but there's one place that it actually reverses. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about monsoons. See if you can find the place where the wind actually reverses direction in July. And think about why that might happen. Also, notably, the trade winds are warm winds that flow for thousands of miles over warm oceans. Thus, they're full of moisture. However, they don't always result in rain. In order for rain to occur, the air must be lifted by convection or some topographic barrier, etc., in order to cool enough for condensation to take place and for precipitation to fall. But if this warm, moist air is forced to lift, you can get really heavy rainfalls. If you've ever been on the Big Island Hawaii, on the eastern part of the island, you know that it's a virtual rainforest on the eastern side of the island. All right, we have seen that the northeast and southeast trade winds blow from the subtropical high to the intertropical convergence zone, which is a low pressure. The subtropical high is also the source for a second wind, the westerlies, which flow from the subtropical high at 30 degrees towards the subpolar low, or what your book calls the polar front, at 60 degrees. Again, note that divergent clockwise flow out of the subtropical high. Unlike the trade winds, however, the westerlies are quite variable in speed and direction. As their name implies, the general movement is from the west, but they can flow from the northwest, the southwest, or even sometimes more directly from the north and south. Thus this region between 30 and 60 degrees, where the westerlies dominate, is quite variable in terms of its weather. We know that because we live here. Indeed, most of the United States lies within the westerlies. Although the surface winds of the westerlies are quite variable, there are two upper atmosphere cores to the westerlies that are quite strong and consistent the polar front jet stream, and the subtropical jet stream. You can read a little bit more about them here on this diagram or in your textbook. If you've traveled by airplane east from California, perhaps your pilot has mentioned that you've caught the jet stream. If so, you likely arrived at your destination early. Also, flying east to west in this region generally takes longer 
as you're battling the westerlies the whole way.